Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really great to see so many of you logged in here today. So welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Valerie Schrader. I'm the Associate Professor of Communication Arts and Sciences and the Honors Coordinator at the Schuylkill Campus here at Penn State University in Pennsylvania. And I'm excited to share with you some of my research today. Uh, so first, I just would like to thank Penn State Schuylkill for making this possible, um, especially to Sam Bowers and to Leah Morrison in the Strategic Communication Department, uh, as well as John Peters, Vince Mitchell, and Julie Meyer, who are our, our Zoom and IT experts. Um, and to Darcy Medica, the Director of Academic Affairs. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and join us um, to chat about Outlander and public memory today. Uh, welcome. So before we get started today, I thought I would just briefly tell you about how this project sort of came to be in the first place. Um, so I just finished my revisions on my book project, Public Memory in the Television Series Outlander. Um, with Lexington Books, uh, which is a division of Roman and Littlefield and Academic Press. And we're hoping that the book will be out uh, at the end of the year, so fingers crossed it'll uh, come out soon. Uh, this project's actually a little outside my usual wheelhouse. So I usually publish on rhetorical messages and musical theater, actually. Um, most of my research publications are, are on shows like Hamilton and Wicked. Uh, so I sort of stumbled into the Outlander project about two years ago when three of my honor students wanted to do a communication conference panel on public memory and popular culture. So they needed a fourth panelist and I happened to be watching Outlander at the time. Um, and I thought, well, something just clicked. Let's go ahead and do a project on this. So the Outlander project was born and a few months later, I got to teach a course on it at my campus. And we actually planned a week long study abroad trip to take some of my honor students to Scotland in conjunction with the course. Now, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, study abroads got canceled, including ours. So while I had to cancel everything that was originally planned for my class to travel, I did end up rebooking the trip as a personal research trip. Um, so basically, I could experience all of the public memory places that we're going to talk about today uh, for my book project. And I talk, took lots of photos, um, some of which you'll see today, um, and a lot of videos for my students, who I call uh, Moliana which is uh, my students in Scottish Gaelic. And for those of you that know Scottish Gaelic, forgive my pronunciation. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. <laughs> so Scottish Gaelic's a little outside my wheelhouse. Um, but I took a lot of photos from the trip and I'm gonna share some of them with you today on these slides. And I even have a short video to show you that I took for Moliana in class. Uh, so actually on this first slide, if you can see it, that's actually Blackness Castle, uh, which is Fort William in the show. Um, that's me with my husband and my best friend um, outside Blackness Castle. Um, so today I'm going to go over some topics that we covered in class and I'll go into detail on some of the stuff I talk about in the book. Uh, so first I'm actually going to start with my research method of rhetorical criticism and what public memory is. And I know that's a little boring, but we always have to set up our theory and our method before we get into the actual fun research. Um, and then we'll apply it to Outlander. So I'd also like to note that we have a chat box function um, down at the bottom of your screen that you can post questions. So if you have questions, feel free to post them in the chat box and I'll try to get to them at some point in the presentation. Um, I know a few of you had submitted questions early, so I do have those with me as well. And I'll answer those at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and there's also a poll function. Um, it's the first time I'm using the poll function down at the bottom of your screen here. Um, and I'm going to try to make the uh, webinar a little bit more interactive so that you guys can participate in the polls. Um, and you'll find both of these down at the bottom of your screen. So let's try out the poll function to get started here. Um, so if you go down to where the polls are, um, there's a question. And I'm going to launch the polling here. And I think it's probably going to launch all of the questions, but we only need to do the first one here. So if you go ahead and look at the first question, it asks you, what is your experience with Outlander? Um, I'm new to Outlander, I've seen the television show, I've read the novels, and I've seen the television show and read the novels. So go ahead and click whichever one fits you. And I know we have a lot of major Outlander fans here, so I have a feeling we're probably going to see um, those last three checked quite a bit. I'll give you guys a minute or so to go ahead and click that. Hopefully everybody's been able to find the poll function. 
Okay. It's okay if it's not working for you too. I know sometimes uh, we have a little bit of issue with technology. So if it's not, it's okay. Um, you know, don't, don't stress about it. Oh, it's not letting you submit without answering all the questions. Okay. Unfortunately, it didn't really let me set it up properly, I guess. All right. Um, well, <laughs> let's do this. Throughout the presentation, take some time and you can answer all of the questions when you feel like it. Um, and I will come back and check from time to time um, since we're having a little bit of trouble with this. But it does look like a lot of you guys have seen both the television show and read the novels. Um, so we will come back and check on the other questions from time to time. Feel free to fill it out at any point in the presentation here. All right, so um, it looks like you guys are very familiar with Outlander, which is great. Um, now, before we get into talking a little more about Outlander, I do wanna go briefly over the method and the theory so that we understand um, how to apply that to our text. So I can go on to the next slide here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about rhetorical criticism as a research method. So I'm a rhetorical critic. That's what I do um, for a living. That's how I do my research. And um, different researchers, different academics do different kinds of research. So if you're a scientist, you're probably doing things like lab work and field work. Um, if you're a social scientist, you might be doing some stuff with statistical analysis. Um, so I'm a rhetorician. And so what I do is I study text. I study, um, I do a close analysis of the text using theory um, to, depending on how you want to look at it, discover meanings in those texts or to create meanings in those texts. Um, and so these texts, when we talk about this, these are basically any kind of cultural artifact, something that holds meaning um, for a community. So these might be speeches, they might be films, um, they might be songs or museum exhibits when you go to a museum. Um, a website could even be analyzed as a text. I usually study a lot of musical theater, so for me, a lot of times it's a, it's a play or a musical. Um, and obviously television shows are also text, because um, Outlander is a text as well. So in communication studies, uh, we apply rhetorical or communication theories to text, and public memory is one of those that we'll talk about in a minute here. Um, but it is important to note that um, as a rhetorical critic, you might actually find multiple messages in a text, and different people interpret text differently. So you might have the same text, but one person would see it one way and another person would see it another way. And basically, as a rhetorician, your job is to make your case for your interpretation. And we do that by providing evidence from the text and interweaving it into theory so that we can back up our argument, essentially. So that's what rhetorical criticism is. And now I'll go ahead and get into our theory briefly here. So public memory, what is public memory? So I like to use John Bodner's definition uh, from 1994 here. I think it's pretty comprehensive. And he basically defines it as a body of beliefs and ideas about the past that help a public or society understand both its past and present and by implication its future. So in other words, public memory is beliefs about the past that are shared by a particular group. And this group can be a very small community or it can be an entire nation or anything in between. And public memory is often um, created through memory places, things like memorials or museums, um, but it can also be created through different forms of media. Uh, a lot of times they study digital archives, but things like uh, films and television shows can also create public memory. Now it's important to note that public memory is socially constructed through communication with other people. And basically what that means is that uh, we can't have an individual memory. Like that's a different thing. That might be something we study in psychology. We each have our own personal memories. But when we're talking about a collective memory or a public memory, that's something that's shared among people. Um, so we can't have one person have a public memory. Public memory is something that's shared by a community. Um, and it tends to serve particular functions for the group that shares it. Um, it's also important to note that public memory doesn't always align with documented history. It's not the same thing as documented history. So when we think of documented history, we think of like what you learn in your history book. And you know, generally documented history tries to be objective, right? Tries to set things you know, as, as objectively as possible. 
Uh, whereas public memory, it's inherently subjective because it takes meaning from the community that shares it. Um, so to give you an example of what this looks like, a few years ago, I was reading a study by Rodinger and DeSoto, who were psychologists, and they had uh, surveyed 300 people in the, uh, the U.S., um, and they found that 71% of their respondents believed that Alexander Hamilton was a U.S. president, except Alexander Hamilton wasn't a U.S. president. Uh, he was a founding father, um, but he was never elected president. So in this case, you know, 71% of the respondents believe that he was. It's embedded in public memory, but it's not the same as documented history. So the two are a little bit different, and I hope that that'll sort of illustrate what I mean there. Um, so to go a little bit further into our theory before we introduce Outlander, um, there's six assumptions that Blair Dickinson and Ott note in their book, Places of Public Memory in 2010. And I think these six assumptions basically kind of sum up um, the majority of the theory. So the first one is that public memory is activated by present issues, concerns, and anxieties. So basically this means that we think about the past because something in the present prompted that. So for example, um, you may have seen um, on social media or you've seen articles posted about the 1918 flu. There might be some pictures and things like that. And really, we didn't think much about the 1918 flu for years, but because we're currently in the middle of a very big global pandemic, um, we think of probably the last time we had something this widespread, and that was probably the 1918 flu. And so now we're seeing more about the 1918 flu because we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. So because of current issues, we start to think about the past. The second one is that public memory narrates shared identities, constructing senses of communal belonging. So public memory can create communities just as communities can create public memories. So for example, um, if you visit the Statue of Liberty in New York City, it gives us sort of a sense of what it means to be American, right? Our shared American values by seeing the Statue of Liberty. The third one is public memory is animated by affect. And this is sort of a fancy way of saying that emotion is connected to public memory. So for example, if you've ever visited Auschwitz or you've been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, a lot of people cry when they visit these, these places. Um, because there, it's, it's, you know, when you remember these atrocities, particularly related to something like genocide, it makes you cry or scream or get angry. And it's a very emotional experience. And that's connected with public memory. Number four is the public memory is partial partisan and thus often contested. So there's an old saying that says that history is written by the winners, meaning that not all voices are heard equally through every public memory. So for example, not all public memory can encompass every tiny detail. It's impossible for every memory to get every part of the story, right? Um, and so what we do is when we tell a story or we remember a memory, we you know, kind of focus in on certain details and we have to leave others out just because it's impossible to encompass everything. So because some things get left out, it becomes sort of partial or partisan because you're choosing what to leave in and what to leave out. And so because it's, partial and partisan, a lot of times there's contestation, right? People disagree, there's counter memory. And what one community remembers might be very different from what another community remembers. Okay, the fifth one, public memory, relies on material and symbolic supports. So material supports are things like physical, tangible objects, such as old letters or photographs. And symbolic supports are more rhetorical, stuff like language and performance. And with Outlander, we see both of these. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a couple of minutes here. And then finally, uh, public memory has a history. So memory is historically and culturally situated, meaning that it means different things to different people at different times. So I think it's time for another poll. Hopefully we can get this one to work a little bit. Um, so if you go ahead, and if you've already filled it out, that's fine. Um, but if you haven't, go ahead and click it. It asks you, uh, which of the following can create public memory? A museum exhibit about the Battle of Culloden, a folk song about Bonnie Prince Charlie, legends about lost Jacobite gold, or all of the above. So if you haven't had a chance to take it yet, go ahead and click the, the poll.
All right. So it looks like, wow, a lot of you guys picked up all of the above. And you're right, actually. Um, so all of the above can create public memory here. Uh, museum exhibits, folk songs, local myths or legends, they can all create public memory. Um, so movies and televisions actually can do the same thing. So now that we have our toolbox full of tools, I think let's go ahead and bring Outlander into the mix here. All right. So, Outlander started out as a book series, as you guys all know. Um, eight books are currently written by Diana Gabaldon, who is planning for two more. Um, hopefully, book nine will be released in 2020. I know we're all anxiously awaiting that. Um, there's been two, 25 million copies sold since 1991, and it's been translated into uh, 34 languages. So it's a very popular book. And if anyone happened to watch The Great American Read, um, this was on PBS, I think, last year. Um, it was voted number two best love novel in America. It lost only to To Kill a Mockingbird, and it beat out things like classics that were like Jane Eyre and Little Women and, you know, popular books like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. So Outlander was actually voted number two, which is pretty impressive. So this popular book series became a very popular television series. In 2014, um, it, it emerged onto the, the Stars, plat Stars platform, and we currently have 2.1 million likes on Facebook and 519,000 Twitter followers, so it's pretty popular. Uh, the TV series has received People's Choice Awards, TV Guide Awards, Critics' Choice Awards, and it's been nominated for Primetime Emmy and Golden Globe Awards as well. And one of the things that really struck me about Outlander um, is this idea of the Outlander effect. And um, this is basically that the television series sparked a rise in Scottish tourism. So people were seeing the show on their television screens and then they were going to Scotland to visit these places. So uh, the show came out in 2014 and um, by 2016, 2017, Blackness Castle or Fort William that you guys saw at the beginning of the slide um, saw a 72% increase in tourism, and Duncastle, which is Castle Leoch in the series, saw a 50% increase. By 2017, Scotland had actually begun to outperform the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of tourist numbers. <laughs> and by 2018, so many tourists had gone to the Fraser Stone at the Battle of Culloden, uh, the Culloden Battlefield, that the ground around the marker started to erode and the area had to be closed off uh, for repairs temporarily. So that many people were going and visiting it. So to give you a quote um, from Stephen Duncan of Historic Environment Scotland, featuring an outlander has opened up our sites to a whole new audience, inspiring more and more visitors to come and discover the history behind these places, further demonstrating the enduring value and significance of heritage attractions in Scotland. Um, so I think it's really interesting that this television show has sparked this in a way that we haven't really seen uh, with other television shows in other places, at least to this extent. So that really got me interested in this project. So just to briefly, before we go into some examples here, give you the basic setup of the book. Um, so, oh, and I should go back a minute here. Um, so this, this picture over here, um, this is Linlithgow Palace. Um, this was where Wentworth Prison was filmed, though you would never know it from these you know, gorgeous facades here. Um, this was actually the birthplace of Mary Queen of Scots. So, and over here we have the Fraser Stone on this next slide here. Um, so, like any book, we have an introduction and conclusion chapter, um, but for the rest of the seminar today, I'm going to look at these four middle chapters a little bit more. So, I look at public memory of 18th century Scotland, public memory of the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, uh, public memory of place, and this includes um, those scenes that were filmed, or well, that represent uh, France, uh, when they go to France, when they go to the Caribbean, um, and then finally chapter five, which ended up being the longest chapter, believe it or not, um, on colonial America. So um, all of these chapters, we go through and we discuss public memory through being created through a number of elements or material and symbolic supports, as Blair Dickinson and Ott call them. So on this next slide, I'll talk a little bit about how public memory is created in Outlander through these different elements. So the first one I want to talk about is this um, concept of sound elements. So language, dialect, and accent, and music. So um, in, in Outlander, the Scottish Gaelic 
French, German, Mohawk, and Cherokee languages are all often worked into various characters' lines. So in season one, we see the use of Scottish Gaelic without subtitles, and it makes us kind of feel like Claire, right? So Claire is in this place where she can't understand what um, everyone is saying, and because a lot of us don't understand the Scottish um, the Gaelic language either, um, it makes us kind of, you know, commiserate with her in a way, right? She's sort of a fish out of water, a stranger in a new place and time. And so while she can't understand the words and we can't understand the words, um, it builds that sort of identification with our protagonist. Um, the other languages also create sort of a sense of culture because language and culture are very intertwined. Um, so by featuring these other languages, um, Outlander is creating public memory between the connection of, of language and culture. And dialect and accent play into this as well. So in Outlander, characters use a variety of accents to represent each character's background. So British characters speak in RP, and Scottish characters speak with a Scottish accent, French characters speak with a French accent, and so on. And one unique exception to this um, is probably um, that the American characters in 20th century Boston speak with a more standardized American accent rather than a Boston accent. And we can talk about that a little more later if you like, um, about why that decision was made and what impact it might have. Uh, but for now, I want to get to a couple of other things first. Um, the other sound element that really makes a difference is music. And the music sections were probably my favorite parts to write uh, because of my background in theater performance. But if you get a chance, uh, please go and check out Bear McCreary's blog. So McCreary writes all of the music for the show. And he does an amazing job in his blog explaining uh, these really smart choices that he's making. So throughout Outlander, he uses traditional instruments, folk songs, and familiar melodies um, that can cause us to associate these sounds with a particular culture, time period, or event. Um, Outlander's use of bagpipes and fiddles aligns with its Scottish setting. Um, and in season one, when the scenes are set in 1945, if you remember at the very beginning of the series, um, with, with Frank in 1945, you hear the popular music of the post-war era being played. And some of the 1940s music is played in the 18th century scenes as well. It's as if the songs are running through Claire's head, uh, which sort of symbolizes her displacement, at least until she settles into her 18th century life and chooses to stay there. So uh, once she decides she's going to stay there, we start to see the 1940s songs disappear or at least are only put in the 1940s scene. Um, some of these songs reflect particular characters too, so they have their own musical themes in some cases. When we get to season two, um, some of the scenes that take place in France in the 1740s feature Baroque style harpsichord, violin, and chamber string music, while scenes that take place in the 1960s and 1970s feature popular songs from the 1960s. Um, in season three, uh, traditional Caribbean percussion instruments like congas, quintos, and shakers are all used to create a sound that viewers would associate with the islands of Jamaica and Hispaniola. And in season four, percussion instruments and rattles are used in scenes that feature the Cherokee and the Mohawk, and pioneer life is represented through the use of bluegrass instrumentation. Now, on rare occasions, Outlander does incorporate a non-period song to make a statement, to foreshadow a plot line, or to bring out the emotion in a scene. Um, and again, we can talk about that a little bit later if we have some time. Uh, but I would like to move on to our next type of elements here, and these are called mise-en-scene elements. Now, mise-en-scene elements are visual elements that set the stage for the action in a film, a performance, a TV show. Um, so these are the visual things that you see on your screen. And probably um, the most obvious one is the filming locations. And I do want to get to that, but I have a whole slide on that a little bit later. So if you could just hang tight a little bit longer about the filming locations, I would like to start with costumes instead. So one of the things I'd like to talk about with costumes is the use of tartans. So tartans are those plaid, um, you know, the plaid kilts and the plaid dresses that they wear. Um, and you'll notice that the tartans are used a lot in Outlander, especially in the early seasons. And tartans right now are very much a source of Scottish clan pride, right? Um, I'm from Clan McCullough, and I have a little pin that has my tartan on it. Um, you know, and the interesting thing is that these tartans that we have now may or may not actually be the same tartans that were worn in the 18th century. 
So after Culloden, um, the British banned the tartans. The British actually banned a lot of things. And one of the things was tartans. You guys might remember a scene, um, I think it was in season three, where Murtaugh gets in trouble um, because he has a little swatch of a tartan, and tartans are banned. So by the 19th century, though, Victorians were trying to bring back the tartans, mainly because Queen Victoria has Scottish heritage. Um, but much of what we associate as a clan's particular tartan now is actually based on the Victorian research and may or may not actually be what people actually wore in the 18th century. Plus, each clan had different tartans, so they might have had a hunting tartan and a dress tartan and maybe a few leather tartans. Um, so what we associate with a particular clan may or may not actually be what that original tartan looked like. So this created a real challenge for Terry Dresbach and her costume team. Um, so they decided uh, that what they would do is use dyes that were readily available in the 18th century, um, particularly in that area of Scotland, to make the fabrics for the dresses and the kilts. And that's why you'll see the Fraser and Mackenzie tartans on the shelf. They look a little similar uh, because they would have had access to the same dyes. And for book readers in the audience, uh, you know the, the, the description of the Mackenzie and Fraser tartans in Diane Gabaldon's books um, isn't the same as the tartans in the show, and this is why, because they chose two different ways of representing them. So some other costumes uh, that are used as mise-en-scene elements here um, include the season two costumes in France that are these bold, extravagant scoop, hoop skirt dresses and embroiders men's vests um, that reflect 18th century upper class French society. Um, and some of these costumes are later adjusted for season three's Caribbean episodes. If you look in, um, say, for example, the ballroom scene um, with what Claire and Jamie are wearing, those are you know, the season two costumes that have been adjusted because they would have had very limited outfit choices um, after sailing across the ocean. And then season four highlights colonial dresses and men's tricorn hats and clothing that is worn by the Cherokee and Mohawk that reflect both the time period and each tribe's color symbolism. So episodes that take place in the 60s are kind of interesting too because these feature costumes from the living memory of Terry Dressbach and her costume team, which creates public memory in a little different way than the costumes in eras where people didn't live. So lots of folks have lived through the 1960s and they might remember, um, oh, I had a dress like that, or I remember that, that costume. Um, whereas, you know, you can't do the same thing with something that's set in the 18th century because none of us lived through the 18th century. <laughs> um, so, Dressbach actually has talked about how she loves designing the 1960s clothing, uh, particularly Brianna's, uh, because they're close from her childhood. And so, overall, the attention of detail that goes into Outlander's costumes really helps create public memory in a way that more closely aligns with documented history than period television shows and films that use maybe more stylized costumes that create an artistic effect, but maybe don't really align very much with documented. So in addition to the costumes, uh, we also have different things like props, hairstyles, transportation, that all fit into these mise-en-scene elements. So things like Claire's medicine vials, baskets, um, small props that were designed to look like things that they find in a history book or in a museum. Um, hairstyles and men's facial hair often reflect uh, the time periods that Outlander illustrates. And so do things like wagons and carriages and other modes of transportation. So all of these little details can aid in the creation of public memory of a particular place and a particular time. And then the last element, or a group of elements, I guess I should say, that we're going to talk about is acting and directing choices. And these choices can really impact um, the creation of public memory as well. So for acting choices, I just want to give one example here. Um, I think we all remember Andrew Gower's portrayal of Charles Stewart. You guys all remember Mark Me? We heard that quite a bit in season two. Um, so Andrew Gower's portrayal of Charles Stewart allows us to understand why the Bonnie Prince was so persuasive, even while he made some very serious tactical errors. Um, and we're invited to see him as an idealistic and passionate man uh, with delusions of grandeur and a belief in a God-given mission. And this allows us to understand maybe why Stuart might have done the things that he did in real life based on that portrayal. 
And this can really be said by any of the actors that play real historical figures. So we see other historical figures in Outlander as well. Um, we remember maybe uh, Governor Tryon or, or George Washington in this recent um, last couple of seasons, um, you know, King Louis the 15th in season two. And so um, for the actors that are playing these historical figures, they have sort of that opportunity to shape public memory of these particular figures, which is kind of cool. And then directing choices can also make a difference here. So the example I'd like to give with this is the Battle of Culloden. Um, so it was filmed as a series of flashbacks in Jamie's mind rather than one long battle sequence. So if you remember um, the first episode of season three, when um, you know, Jamie is experiencing his flashbacks of the battle, um, and that's how we experience them as viewers. So the decision to do this was actually um, done for financial reasons because it's very expensive to do a full reenactment. Um, you know, that would have all of those costumes and all those people, and it would be a very expensive thing to do. So they chose to do it for financial reasons, but what it results in is a more personalized view of the battle because we see it through Jamie's eyes. So essentially, we're seeing a representation of what a Jacobite officer might have experienced at the Battle of Culloden, and this personalized account might create more of an emotional connection that we see in public memory. So before we start to move on to, I have two examples that I want to go over today um, in a little more detail, but I'd like to take a look at our poll again uh, for one more poll question here. So this one asks, um, before watching or reading Outlander, how familiar were you with the Scottish clan system? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, slightly familiar. Um, almost everything I learned about the Scottish clans is from Outlander, or what's a Scottish clan? And it's okay if you're asking what a Scottish clan is. All right, so we have, most folks are sort of in the middle here. So if somewhat familiar, slightly familiar, um, or you learned a lot from Outlander. So that's really cool. Um, I'm probably in that bucket as well. <laughs> I would probably say that before studying this, I was probably somewhat familiar, or maybe slightly familiar, um, but I definitely wasn't very familiar. Um, oh, before I move on here, this is Kurops, the, the pictures here. This is um, Crane's Mirror. This is uh, where Galus and, and Claire were picking herbs. And then this is a picture of the, the town, some of the cobbles I thought were really cool. All right, so let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, by the way, this is Castle Leah or Dun Castle. And look, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Scottish clan system right now. Um, so, Outlander portrays the Scottish clan system by using Clan Mackenzie in season one, particularly, and to some extent, season two, um, as a representative example. So we learn about uh, the clans through Clan Mackenzie. So to use McLean's definition from 1995 here, a clan was an independent principality, a group of individuals owing loyalty to no one but their chief, while it was the duty of the chief, like the monarch of an independent state, to pursue whatever line of conduct corresponded most closely to the interest of his clan. And so the clan was governed by a chief or a laird. Um, his advisors were called chieftains. You guys remember Dougal um, was the war chieftain of Clan Mackenzie. Um, and the heir was called the Tannis. So that, would, that ended up being Hamish, if you guys remember little Hamish. Um, the chief ruled over all, so he made all the decisions for the clan, he passed judgment, he kept order, he declared war, um, he threw the best parties, right? So he was kind of in charge of everybody. Um, Tanistry was the system that they used to choose an heir, and it was different from the English primogeniture system that we might be familiar with. So in the English primogeniture system, the oldest son inherits, and it's always the oldest son. Whereas in Tanistry, um, it's a little bit different. So Tanistry is a system of choosing an heir from a number of individuals, and they all have hereditary claims. Um, these are most often being chosen as uh, their male clan members who had great grandfathers that were chiefs in the past. But there might be, you know, a whole group of them that you get to choose from. So it's not that this one person necessarily has to become heir. It's that you have a group of people that you can choose from, um, you know, who you think would be best to lead the clan. 
So um, in Outlander, we see these concepts being illustrated through Plant McKenzie. So Colum is our chief or our laird, if you guys remember Colum, and he's always showing hospitality and wealth uh, through these grand banquets that he throws. Um, and they always have wine and music and food. And he's always thinking about what is best for the clan. And this sometimes puts him at odds with Dougal, right, his brother, because Dougal is most concerned with getting a Stuart king. So for Dougal, it's most important that we choose the king, right, as a national priority. Whereas for Colum, it's most important that he does what is right for the clan. So um, I guess in a way, we can kind of think of it as being national versus local elections in some ways. Um, so anyhow, if you're thinking, um, if you keep thinking that Colum's ultimate goal is to put the clan first, right? Everything else that he does starts to make sense because he makes some you know, choices that we might not choose, right? Um, so for example, he insists on Claire staying at the castle as a healer to provide medical care for his clan's people. So we see it through Claire's eyes and this isn't fair to her, she wants to go back. Um, but, you know, if you see it through Colum's eyes, he's providing a doctor to care for his people. Um, he gets Dougal to father Hamish, or at least he's aware of the whole situation, um, to ensure a continuation of the clan. Um, and then he gets angry at Jamie when he marries Claire, because he thinks that Jamie's probably the best person to lead Clan Mackenzie after his death, and knows that the clan would never accept Claire as Lady of Clan Mackenzie because she's a Sassanac. So this is also why he doesn't really help her when she's arrested for witchcraft. He's like, well, all right, just let it happen. So when we start to think of it that way, we start to kind of understand why Colm's making these decisions. And some of these decisions may not be very good decisions, at least how we see it. Um, but the objective here is to try to put the clan first. So in addition to this, we see Tanistry in Outlander a little bit here. So in episode four of season one, uh, Jamie is put in the precarious situation of having to decide whether or not to pledge allegiance to Colum. If you guys remember when Claire tries to escape the castle and Jamie finds her and brings her back and then he gets stuck trying to figure out what to do. Um, so Jamie belongs um, to Clan Fraser, right? But his mother was a Mackenzie and Colum's his uncle. So he technically would be in the line to be a potential tannist. Now, if he swears allegiance to Colum, he'll be in the running to be chief after Colum's death um, due to the system of tanistry. Now, if you remember Murtaugh kind of commenting on this, um, he predicts that Dougal, who hopes to be declared the tannist, uh, would be willing to kill Jamie if Jamie should swear allegiance. Now, meanwhile, if Jamie doesn't swear allegiance to Colum, Colum might be angry and his clansmen might kill Jamie, who they would see as a traitor for not doing the oath. So Jamie adeptly avoids this, right? Um, he swears his friendship and allegiance, um, and he swears his obedience to Colum as long as he's residing on Mackenzie lands, but he means, maintains his own oath to his own clan. Now ultimately, if we fast forward a little bit to season two, when Colum's on his deathbed, um, he declares Hamish his successor, uh, but he appoints Jamie to mentor him until he's of age, so he kind of gets to do this anyway. Um, so in his decision, decision selecting who's going to serve as mentor to the Tannis, um, Colum does what he believes is best for Clan Mackenzie, uh, showing the Tannistry selection process in action, essentially. So through Outlander's portrayal of the clan system, we're invited to learn about Scottish history, particularly history that may not be very well known. Um, and we're invited to reflect on current issues, actually. So for example, when we reflect on Colum's leadership or Really, if you fast forward all the way to seasons four and five, Jamie's leadership in later seasons, it makes us reflect on what qualities make a good leader and um, these difficult choices that leaders often have to choose. Um, and so we see that connection here. So before we get to our next example, let's take a look at the poll again. So I'll go back up here. Um, and my next question for you is, were there witch trials in the 1740s in Scotland? Oh, in this one, we have a whole mix. All right. So some folks are saying yes, some folks are saying no, some folks are saying not sure. Well, that's what we're gonna talk about next. So let's go ahead and flip to the next slide here. 
And our second example is about witch trials in, 19, in 1740 Scotland. Um, and also this is Crane's Mirror or Kuras. Um, you can see the pillory. Obviously there would be no car there if we were, you know, an outlander. But um, as I was there in 2020, we had a car. <laughs> so let's talk just briefly about witch trials here. So while many aspects of the events that occur in Outlander are based on documented history, uh, the series does take some artistic liberties with certain events for the sake of storyline and character development. So probably the most noticeable instance um, in season one is in episode 11, when Claire and Galus Duncan are tried as witches. So the episode takes place in the early 1740s, but as Diana Gabaldon observes in her interview with Ashley DeLuca of National Geographic, the last witch trial in Scotland took place in the 1720s. So witchcraft was a, stop, was a crime in Scotland um, from 1563 to 1736, with the last execution taking place in 1727, and most prosecutions occurring between 1590 and 1662. So Gabaldon states that she wrote the witch trial plotline intentionally, despite knowing its timeline didn't quite align with documented history, justifying its existence as an ad hoc affair that didn't make it into history. So there probably weren't any witch trials in, 17, in the 1740s. Those would have ended by the 1720s. Um, but uh, because of the, the storyline and the plotline that we'll get to in a minute here, uh, they chose to, to leave it in. So though there weren't really witch trials in Scotland in the 1740s, uh, the details of Claire and Galus's trial actually aligns pretty closely with descriptions of witch trials in Scotland. So for example, uh, they're targeted by other members of the community because they use magic. So you might remember the scene where Galus was attempting to summon Mother Nature, um, and Claire practiced medicine. And for most 18th century Highlanders, they didn't really see the difference between medicine and magic. There, there, there was a very fine line and they kind of assumed they were the same thing. Um, so in addition to, you know, kind of being targeted because of their use of quote, magic, um, they also found, you can also see how the case was built against them on flimsy hearsay evidence. And it's coming from people that have grievances with them. So in the 17th and 18th centuries, most accused witches were accused by people who knew them in the community and had grievances with them. So these elements are actually very true to what is located in documented history. So even though the timing might be a little bit wrong, the details are pretty close. So the witch trial, um, though its timing is historically inaccurate, um, it plays an important role in the development of Outlander's story and characters. So Claire's traumatic experience at the witch trial prompts her to confess to Jamie that she has traveled back in time from the 1940s. And Jamie believes her and takes her back to Craig Nadoon so that she can return home. So when she decides instead to stay with him in the 18th century, their bond is strengthened. And so in addition to developing the characters and their relationship more fully, the aftermath of the witch trial also turns what was once Claire's story into the couple's story. So we actually end up with two protagonists then, um, and it further develops the plot of the series. So in this case, uh, the witch trial serves more of a literary function than a memory function, um, but it might cause us to reflect on the history of witch trials, as well as issues that can even impact us today, because remember, um, public memory is always related to the present. It's, it's not something that's just historically situated. There's that connection. So, um, for example, scapegoating of an outcast is something we still see today. The reliance on this flimsy hearsay evidence is truth instead of research fact-based evidence. Um, and mob mentality that generates from fear and causes a community to turn against outsiders or even one of their own. So these are still things that happen now, even though it might be a little bit different setting than it would have been um, in the 1700s. Um, but you see this connection between public memory, um, history, and, and you know, the current time period. So for, before we get to our last topic, we have one more poll question for you guys. If you haven't had a chance to fill out the poll, please go ahead and take a minute here. Um, so the question that we have for you at the end here is have you ever visited any of the filming locations in Outlander? Because I did promise we would talk about filming locations and that's what's coming up next. 
So it looks like um, <laughs> it looks like most folks are saying not yet, but I hope to someday, and I, I hope you do too because it really is a great experience. Um, and it looks like 28% of you said yes. You you have them to Scotland, which is fantastic. Um, if you folks aren't interested, and that's fine. Um, and we do have one percent. Somebody said that they've been to the North Carolina sites, which is awesome. Um, so that's something that I'm really interested in as well, maybe a future research project here. So let's go ahead and get to the next slide. All right. So the first season and some of the second season in Outlander um, are filmed in the Scottish Highlands. So this is where the Highland clans once lived and where the Battle of Culloden took place near Inverness. Um, and this allows us to see the physical landscape of events that took place uh, that basically creates a visual image of public memory that the series co-creates with us as audience members. So this visual image of place is associated with public memory is really similar to what you might experience as a visitor to, you know, a place where you go to a battlefield, for example, or something, you know, a physical place like that. And I mean, this is what is sort of contributing to the Outlander effect, right? We see these places on our television and we want to go and visit them because they're beautiful. Now, however, while in season one, the events that we see on our screens take place in Scotland where the scenes are also filmed, in seasons two, three, and four, filming locations actually differ from their on-screen representations. And this is actually a pretty common thing. It's, it's kind of rare that, um, you know, Outlander does film the Scottish scenes in Scotland. Um, most places, you know, film in a studio or, um, you know, a different location. So now it does do this in these later seasons. So 18th century France was actually filmed in the Czech Republic. Um, the Caribbean islands were filmed in South Africa. And the colonial North Carolina scenes uh, were filmed in Scotland, actually. So I wonder what does this, how does this impact uh, public memory of place? And are we going to see the same outlander effect happening in these places as we see um, in the Scotland locations? So really, this raises a number of questions that future research may want to look at, uh, particularly through audience analysis studies. So they're a little outside my field of rhetorical criticism, but they're things that you know, future researchers may want to take a look at. So do we notice when a filming location aligns with a represent, represented location or when it differs from that? Um, and if we do notice when it differs, um, is public memory formed differently than if these two locations were the same? Does this cause confusion for viewers? Um, does it inspire us to learn more about the history of the filming location or the represented location or both of them? And is that emotional connection that happens with public memory lessened if it's filmed in a different location than what it's actually represented? Um, these are just some of the questions that future research might want to look into in more depth. And um, before we go and take some questions today, I would just like to share with you a little bit about my own experience in some of these filming locations. Uh, but I would kind of like to caveat that I'm only one person and people may have very different experiences than what I did, but this was sort of my take on it. Um, so in March 2020, I was able to go on an Outlander tour to see Blackness Castle, Linlithgow Palace, Dun Castle, and Kuras, which is what um, all these pictures throughout the, the slideshow were. And while the sites that we visited were all Outlander filming locations, and the tour guide played the season one soundtrack and talked with us about the show. Um, the historical sites themselves, and with one per the exception of possibly Dune Castle, um, they made very little note of their Outlander connection, believe it or not. So Blackness Castle, that's Fort William, and Lilithgow Palace, Wentworth Prison, only really make reference to the show at their entrance and gift shop areas. And instead, they focus on the documented history of the location. So Blackness Castle emphasizes the lives of some of its famous prisoners, and Linlithgow Palace uh, centers around its connection with Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, in contrast, Dun Castle, that's our Castle Leoch that we saw in that one slide, um, it's actually been used as a filming location for other television shows and movies, in addition to Outlander. Um, and it's a little more Outlander-focused, offering an audio tour um, that features Sam Hune, that's Jamie, uh, telling visitors about um, how the creative team added extra dirt around the castle to film episode four, among other details. Now, in Kuras, this was Cranesmuir. Our tour guide provided us with 
a walking tour of the garden where Claire and Galus collected herbs, um, and the pillory featured in episode three, and the building that served as Galus and Arthur Duncan's house that overlooked the square. But what I remember most from visiting Kuras was actually more personal memories and memories that actually reflect the documented history of the area. So some of the things that I was struck by are the ancient cobblestone streets that had large cobbles for nobility and small cobbles for commoners. Um, I remember my husband and my best friend trying to find an open coffee shop because it was really cold that day. Um, you know, I remember going and visiting a photography shop where I purchased the beautiful photo of Edinburgh. And so while I might have chosen to tour these places because of Outlander, what I got from the experience was actually much more connected with documented history and enabled me to create these treasured personal memories as well. So um, as I promised, I did want to include at least one video that I made for Mole Anak or my students. Um, so this one, I hope it works, is of Joan Castle in the area that was Mrs. Fitz's kitchen. And um, I should note, it looks very different than what it did in the show. So if you'll just uh, listen here for a minute, we can listen to it here. Oh, you have no sound. I'm so sorry. Really, it's more about the visual anyway. It's just me chatting about it. <laughs> All right. Um, so now I apologize. I am not a great videographer, as you may have noticed. Um, I stare at walls a little bit too long. Uh, so forgive that. But hopefully it gives you a little bit of idea of what it would have been like to, to be there. And so um, now we have about eight minutes. And I would like to go ahead and uh, answer some questions. So I do have some, I'd like to start with the ones that uh, we had from uh, some folks that posted it on our Facebook event a little bit early. Um, so I'll start with those and then I'm gonna join into some of the ones you guys have on the chat here. So feel free uh, to, to add a couple of uh, questions in the chat here. Um, so the first question I have is from Katie O'Neill Ray. And Katie asks, do we know if the author of Outlander researched a family or was trying to tell their story? And if so, how well did she stick to their story or real life or timeline? Uh, so hi, Katie, thank you for this question. Um, so what, from what I've researched, it doesn't look like Diana Gabaldon's characters were actually based on any particular one family, um, but I do have a really interesting story for you about how she came to decide that Jamie was a member of Clan Fraser. So in a book by Roberts called The Jacobite Wars, he tells a story of a Jacobite officer named John Fraser. And John Fraser was wounded, captured, and brought to Culloden House by the British after the battle. The wounded officers were all shot or left to die, except for Fraser, who managed to escape and then published his account in 1749. So Diana Gabaldon clearly did her research on this when she wrote about Jamie surviving Culloden. And she actually mentions in that interview with Ashley DeLuca in National Geographic um, that she had read the story of a Fraser officer in Lovett's regiment surviving the Battle of Culloden. Um, and that if she expected Jamie to survive Culloden, then his last name should be Fraser. Um, and so, of course, she also incorporates some real life historical figures that we see as well. Um, so, um, you know, some of the more well known ones are, are Charles Stewart. Louis the Fifteenth, George Washington, but there are some other um, characters that are also real life historical figures, like Governor William Tryon, um, George Murray, and John O'Sullivan, who were commanders in the Jacobite army, um, and even Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett. Do you guys remember Jamie's grandfather? It's kind of a joke, um, but they were all real people. So, uh, so she does incorporate some of these real life historical figures as well. Uh, so, thank you, Katie, for that question. Uh, and so our next question comes from, oh, you know what, before I forget, I do want to, I've got just two quick pictures here for you. Uh, this is Clava Cairns on the left, where um, it's a stone circle that is right near the Battle of Culloden or Culloden Battlefield. Um, so that's actually what uh, Diana Gabaldon based Pregnadoon on. 
And then on the right is um, Kulan Battlefield. That's the, the marker stone in there. Um, and I do want to put up my list of sources here um, that I used for this particular presentation. All right, so our next question comes from Diane Pyle. And she asks, uh, how would you explain Diana's writing style? Uh, so hi, Diane. This is a good question and a very tough question, too. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I would probably start by saying that Diana Gabaldon's writing style is very unique. Um, in an interview with January Magazine's Linda Richards, Diana Gabaldon said that the series is essentially a very rich historical fiction, uh, but it does have a fantastic thread, and it has a very strong romantic thread. And really, it's kind of um, a librarian's conundrum, because how do you classify this thing, right? Is it historical fiction? Is it fantasy? Is it romance? Um, Sam and I were talking last week that it might actually be sci-fi a little bit. Um, so it's really hard to classify um, the book and, and also really the show too. Um, in addition, I'd say the books are very lengthy and very detailed. And personally, I'm impressed with how she develops all of these different storylines. Um, and she always follows through with her storylines too. So they're a little bit streamlined for the television show because it's really impossible to cover in like 12 episodes what it would take like a 900 page book to do. Um, but they're still pretty unique and they really hold our attention. So thank you for that, Diane. And then we have one from Cynthia Jodum who asks, did you study Scottish history and learn about the clans, traditions, and more? Uh, hi, Cynthia, that is a great question. Um, and yeah, I actually did. I had to learn a lot about the clan system and everyday life in Scotland. Um, so I, I, I knew a little bit, but I really had to do a lot of research on this. Um, and actually, probably one of the hardest chapters to write was, the, was chapter three on the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, because military history isn't really my strong suit. So I'm always triple checking my sources for accuracy, and it was a lot of reading about battles and things like that. Um, but I really love learning about Scottish history and the clans, and so I really hope when people are reading, particularly chapter two, because that was like one of those fun things for me to write, uh, that they'll start to fall in love with Scottish history as much as I did. All right, um, so let's see here. We've got some questions. Wow, we've got lots of questions in here. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm just going to scroll up a little bit and see what we can find. Um, so, yes, um, Myra O asked if I was able to visit Culloden. Um, and yes, actually I was. I, I went to Culloden Battlefield and got to experience that. Um, it has an amazing visitor center where you can learn lots about the actual battle. And then just experiencing um, the actual battlefield. It's a very solemn place. Um, and it was, um, it was really interesting to go in and experience that. Um, I also fell in love with Clava Cairns right next door with that. It was very fascinating to be um, in a place that was, you know, thousands of years old like that. All right, let's go up a little bit more here. Um, let's see, question. Um, did I tour independently of your research or offer one of the Outlander tours? Um, so I did go on an Outlander tour um, down through Edinburgh, and so I got to visit a lot of those sites. Um, through one of the Outlander tours. And I would recommend uh, going ahead and, and, you know, booking a tour like that if you want to go ahead and see um, some different areas, um, you know, rather than just going to one location yourself. Um, it depends on how much time you really want to spend, though. If you want to spend a lot of time in one place, it might make more sense just to go to one area for the day. But if you want sort of a, you know, a smorgasbord of all of the different filming locations, uh, then a tour is a good idea. Um, let's see here. I think we've got time for maybe one more. I'm looking for, for question marks, really, here. All right. You guys have some fantastic comments, by the way. Uh, yes, the webinar will be recorded a little bit later. Um, actually, yeah, the side stories. Outlander Adventures asks if I use any side stories in my research. So there are lots and lots of um, historical stuff throughout the book. I'm always kind of going into this is what aligns with documented history and what doesn't. So you'll see there's some side stories uh, that work their way in here. Um, so there's definitely a lot of those throughout. 
Um, all right, so I think we are just about out of time, but I want to thank you all for your fantastic questions and comments um, and for spending the hour with us here. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer everything, um, but I hope that you enjoyed learning about public memory and Outlander. Um, and we will make sure that we get this posted on our uh, YouTube channel a little bit later for anyone that wasn't able to attend. Uh, so thank you all for participating um, and stuff.